I'm never not nervous when I go into those rooms, but I, I do everything I can to show that I'm not nervous and that I can handle this. Welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast, a free resource for women who work in the sports and entertainment industry. Each week we get real and talk about the things that hold us back and how we can overcome them and keep climbing to the top. And the top is however you define it. We talk about the highs, the lows, and everything in between. Consider this podcast your secret weapon. You will learn from the best in the business and be able to take immediate action with all the advice that you hear. I'm your host, Jahan Blake, a leadership development coach and consultant. I've worked in sports for 20 years. 15 of those years were spent working for the Red Sox, Dodgers, and the Cubs. After 15 years of working in the front office, I took a leap of faith and I started my own business. Friends, as a black woman in sports, I know that the industry can take a toll on your confidence and sometimes leave you feeling defeated. Join me each week so I can support you on your journey. I promise you, each week you will feel stronger and more confident than the week before. So let's get started with this week's episode. Failing is one of those things that we all dread, but in order to be successful in business, you're gonna have to take risks. Ugh, and sometimes those risks don't pay off and you feel like a failure, but it's what you do next that matters the most. My next guest, Justine Freud, Senior Director of Marketing for the Chicago Fire FC, talks about why she refuses to play it safe, even if it means failing. Justine shares how she bounces back from failure. She talks about what it takes to lead a team and also make sure that they know it's okay to fail. We not only talk about failure, Justine and I jump into things like growing your career, how to advocate for yourself, how to approach working in a male dominated industry. Let's face it, that's where we all are right now. I am so excited for you to hear my conversation with Justine. I think you're gonna love it. All right, Game of Her Own listeners, let's do this. Justine, welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, I'm excited to be here and appreciate the invite. Let's start off with the first question that I always ask everybody. When did you first fall in love with sports? I, I was a kid in, in PE class way back when, uh, when I lived in California, probably second grade around there. I just wanted all the boys were playing basketball and football and kickball and all these other things. And I just wanted to be, be in with them. And so um, loved sports from then on and uh, oldest of four. So I would sit with my dad and uh, ready to watch NFL, college football, soccer, whatever was kind of on and uh, grew my love from sports from that. Nice. Okay. And did you play? sports growing up? I did. I played, um, I'm a, I'm a firm believer, play as much, as many sports as you, as you truly can. Um, and I got to an age around 13, 14, where I had to focus in on one. I was a surfer, played basketball, played volleyball, oh. football, and then, uh, my sport was soccer. And so when I got to around 12, 13, I was doing some, uh, surf tournaments, contests, and, and then playing soccer on the weekends. And they, they overlap obviously. And, uh, my mother always told me I chose wrong because we would go into the, you know, soccer brings you into the boonies and uh, surfing brings you into the beaches, which where would she rather be? Um, but I chose, <laughs> I, I chose soccer. I don't regret it a day. And then I played D1 uh, at Oregon State University and met my best friends through that. So I, I've loved the journey I was on and, and what soccer brought me. Yeah. So I'm a former soccer player myself, but I'm literally more interested in the surfing part of your life. Like, how did that come to be? Like, you don't hear that often, at least I should say yeah. in my circles, I don't hear that often. Yeah. It's definitely not, um, I would say the most centrally located. I live in Chicago now, so it's definitely not uh, the most popular thing here, <laughs> um, but I, I grew up born and raised in Huntington beach. So I, I went to modern day high school, which it wasn't a big thing, but uh, the local public high school in, in Huntington Beach High School was that that was the thing. It's not football with sports, right? Where everybody goes. It's the soccer con- or the surf contest, excuse me. You know, my my dad was a surfer. He he surfed at UCSB. He just wanted me to get on a board. And uh I did and around, you know, I think my eighth or ninth Christmas got my own surfboard and uh loved it. Uh that's what my cousins did. It's you you want to fit in with the crowd, right? And that that was yeah. that, that you fit in and uh, that's where I grew up was at the beach, not on the soccer fields uh, when I was younger. So I, I loved it. Now, I think if I tried, I think uh, I would get seasick just sitting out there. That's, that's part of the old age. 
but my brother actually surfed competitively and he got to the point where he had to decide, you know, if he was going to go onto the pro realm. And it, it's a, it's probably one of the hardest things to get on is, is pro surfing because there's so limited spots. Uh, once you get into that, there's 32, I believe, spots in, in the World Surf League. And that's across the world. So you're competing for 32 spots on that team, on that sport um, to be considered in that realm. And so um, he ended up going to NYU um, and, and surfs for fun now. So it's definitely a, a fun family thing. Uh, but if I were to do it now, I would absolutely fall flat on my face. You think? No. Yeah, absolutely. It's not like riding a bike. It isn't. <laughs> I've, I've tried it. Let me tell you. I'll, I, if I find video, I'll send to you. And it, it's flat on my face. <laughs> I mean, this is very difficult. I've taken two lessons and the surfers called me princess the entire time, <laughs> but they were super nice to me. But like, I got it. I was like, I know you're making fun of me, but it's fine. Carry yeah. my surfboard for me because it is very heavy. <laughs> I think it's hard. I couldn't stand up at all. Yeah. It's, it's a fun hobby now for people. Like once you do it for your life, but, um, just the, the professional world. But I think what the World Surf League is doing, that's somebody, when people ask me, like, um, from a marketing perspective, what, what league you look after, it's NFL and all of them kind of, they're, they're great at what they do, right? But what the World Surf League does and kind of how they um, per- push their athletes on the social realm and in the marketing realm is just so different, so unique. It's so cool because you have people watching from across the globe in love with the world surf league and not necessarily a team or surfer in that realm. So I think it's really cool what they kind of do and what they emulate based on the sport they are. Yeah. I'll have to check them out and I'll link to those in the show notes for everybody who's listening. um, So they can also check it out if they don't know about it. So it looks like soccer has been, even though your mom said you chose wrong, I mean, I kind of agree, (laughs) but whatever. I mean, that's, you know, personal opinion, but soccer has been in your, like part of your career since the very beginning, right? So you've always worked in sports. Did you know that you wanted to work in sports? No, I had, I had no idea you could work in sports. And I think that's um, something, you know, now that I'm in the position I am, I try to tell college student, high school students when they chat with me, like, when I was growing up, I had no idea when I was even in college playing soccer, obviously you see the, the coaching side of things and you don't realize the behind the scenes of kind of what it takes to get people into the stands, who's designing jerseys, who's, you know, I tell people, I was like, I had no idea you could be a full-time videographer for a sports team. Like it's just yeah. you know not something you, you know about. Um, and so I really try to um, push that through to people. I was like, you go any career path you want to, if you want to do finance for a sports team, go do it. I actually started out uh, once I graduated coaching because I just didn't know. Um, so I coached at a small D3 in Salem, uh, Willamette University, assistant coaching and uh, head coaching at a high school there, thinking that was my career path and uh, obviously took a turn. But I, I truly believe I probably wouldn't be where I am without the coaching experience and, and knowing the soccer realm of things. I don't think it's a, a necessity in any sense of the word, but I think it uh, definitely gives me an advantage um, as I'm kind of thinking about how to market things, how to PR things. It kind of gives you a little bit of an edge, if you would, in connection with the players, which I think is always important. And when did you make that jump? So you went to soccer and then to your coaching. And then when did you realize, okay, I need a little bit more? Or was that your thought process? Uh, I needed more money. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm a very honest person. So yeah, I mean, coaching at D3, assistant coaching and and high school coaching, um, it's a great side gig. It's it's very hard to break into, um, even with the connections I had and everything. And I loved that team. I did it for about a year and a half. And then um, I got into um, kind of running everything in the Pacific Northwest uh, for Kids Love Soccer, which is one of the biggest soccer classes for youth, you know, not necessarily in the team and league side, um, but kind of the, the two to 12 where people kind of want to just come out and have fun. Um, so I was coaching those, marketing them, um, and it taught me kind of everything on the background of things. So that was with Kids Love Soccer. Um, and so loved that and then saw a job opening in Chicago in the NWSL and was like, oh, you could go coach youth on that side and, and jumped into it. And then You know, from there, I think doors just open once your foot's in the door, um, things kind of come to life. So is that when you made your move to the Red Stars or? Yeah. Yeah. So I was actually trying to move back home closer to California. Hadn't lived back at home for about eight years at that point with, you know, college and then professional life. Um, There was one job that just caught my eye with the Chicago Red Stars and that was uh, academy manager. And so um, running their camps and clinics and that, all that fun stuff. And um, the GM at the time asked me, there, there was an opening in PR about nine months in, and I, they asked if I wanted to 
uh, take the leap. I had a communications major, um, had obviously done that at Kids Love Soccer, but it wasn't the priority at all. And so I jumped into it and very, very thankful for that because it got me to where I am today as uh, Senior Director of Marketing and, and Business Communications for the Fire. So it's definitely a, a full circle run of, of what it all is. And that's what I also try to tell people. I'm like, get your foot in the door because you, there, there's so much room for growth once you get your foot in the door at different organizations. And I agree. I, I think there's a level of also, you know, you have to advocate for yourself. Yes. Right. So you come in as an academy manager and then, yeah. you know, now you're a senior senior director at the fire, but when you're at the Red Stars, you started as an academy manager. So how did you like tell people that you wanted more or were you not thinking about it? Um, no, I definitely was. Right. Like, I think I, I try to dive into whatever somebody will give me. And I think that's the biggest thing. I think anybody in sports, the more you can touch and the more you can learn, especially in the beginning of your career, um, it's just going to help you kind of uh, show your worth and show what more you could do. I firmly believe that helps me get to where I am today. But when I was there, I, I saw the opening and I said yes immediately. And I was like, I could do both. I could do a hybrid role. I could do whatever you kind of want me to do. And, you know, in the NWSL and WNBA, the staffs are a lot smaller than you see on, on the men's side and you're touching so many different things. So um, definitely jumped into the PR role, which the PR role there uh, was, you know, website PR stuff, getting connected with the media that's in Chicago, had to, you know, reach out to them all blindly, didn't know anybody. And then, you know, I think the biggest thing on any sports thing is, especially on the PR side, is getting to know the players and the coaching staff and, and building the trust with them. And that just doesn't come overnight, especially I think as we see the news of what's, you know, sadly in the NWSL and, and, and building those relationships and trust with them, like they want somebody to trust. And if you could be that person that they're trusting on the front office side and help, you know, not only build the Chicago Red Stars brand, but their own brands, the more they're going to trust you. And I think that was the biggest key thing. And I think that goes back to my playing days of just understanding what they're kind of going through on a, on a day-to-day -day basis and really enjoying it and, and falling in love with the sport and the players and wanting to build that brand. It was a, a big passion of mine. And I think the more you, you can touch and whatever somebody's offering you, I think it's never a bad thing. And I think you could always use it in, in life professionally as you continue to grow. Yeah. And so I, I love that you poured your heart and energy and soul into the role that you were in. It sounds like you were leading from where you were, focusing on what you needed to get done, open to moving and growing. You seem like a very straightforward person in the short time, you know, 15 minutes that we've known each other. Were you direct in saying like, hey, I want to, you know, I want to move up. How do I do that? Or consider me for this role. Like, what was your approach? I just went for it. I didn't, I didn't really say I, I wanted it. I would sit in the meetings that I wanted to sit in. And I said, like, this makes sense that marketing and PR, they should be sitting in it. So once I took over the PR side, I think it was about uh, a year into that, that I was like, so much go in hand in hand of what we're marketing, why we're marketing, the smaller staff size. Um, so I started to lead the marketing side as well. And I think, you know, as you kind of show your worth and, and you show what you're doing, people start to respect that. And so um, from there, I became director of marketing and communications for the, for the Chicago Red Stars and kind of was able to build a team from that. So, you know, full-time graphic designer, full-time video, um, a marketing communications coordinator, if you would. And I think a lot of it has to do with who you're hiring, especially in the, in the NWSL in the beginning phases it was when I was there. Um, I had a great, great team in the beginning phases and, and throughout my tenure with the club. And I think that also helps. I think um, people buying in and believing what you're doing, but also having the, the free reign to say like, it's our day to design a jersey for the club. And this is going to be, you know, a merchandise item that you're going to have for the rest of your life. Like, what do you want to do with it? Let's go big. And so steered away from the question a little bit, but I think, you know, in, in the the run of things, as I look back at that time, it was me really just kind of Arnim, who was the, the he's still the owner, owner at the time and, you know, day-to-day -day CEO, if you would. I just went to him and, and really said like, this this is what we're doing. This is what we can continue to do. And you put that plan in, in place and you show it. And I think people respect that. I think, you know, you show, show a reason why it's working, whether it's, you know, the analytics behind what you're doing on organic social, paid media, email marketing, or your idea for a jersey. And it's like, let's bring it to life. Let's execute. And I think people respect people that can go into it and execute it and just want to continue to build it. I like that because that could be scary for some people. It is. Really. And, or maybe it is scary for you or yeah. you know, it was in, the, in that, in that time period. Like it's, it's can be difficult to do. And what I hear from some of my clients or just colleagues is that fear like stops them. 
right? Mm-hmm. Like it stops them from moving forward. So you're like, I took it to the CEO. This is what we're doing. This is why here's the backup. And then you believe in your idea and then you go, were you afraid to fail? Absolutely. And I did fail multiple times. Uh, Say more. Tell us yeah. more. Yeah. So um, there, there's always that room for fear, right? And I think that's that's why we love what we do. Like you never know as a marketer what might stick on, onto the wall and kind of really excel. But I remember one of the most the, the one of the best selling jerseys in Red Stars history. And I, I really pride myself on the on the jerseys we created there because they were so out of the realm of what every other sports team is doing. And, and Nike is a great partner for that league. And Marin at the league at, at the Nike office is, is willing to help and kind of build these unique jerseys where I think um, a lot of other leagues just stick to the, the general shelf items. And the, the first jersey I turned in was immediately denied by Nike Legal. I was like, had the back step. And I was like, now we have something due in, in two weeks. And uh, this isn't allowed. We were trying to play off capturing the audience from the U.S. Women's National Team and everything they built and kind of emulating that, if you will, into a jersey. And uh, look back now, and I was very young at the time, understood why it was illegal to do and what we were turned down to do. But, you know, I think from that, it it got uh, me and Anthony, who was the graphic designer at the time at the Red Stars, to think about like, well, what else can we do? Let's go something crazy. Um, And so we thought about what our favorite kits were. And one of them that stood out was the Nigeria kit for the World Cup and just how how well it sold, first of all, but how cool it was. And that's something that's just so missing from, I think, uh, what we see. And I think there's really cool stuff out there. And when you do cool stuff and test the limits, I think it's something cool. So that actually created the Elevated Kit, which is one of the best-selling kits in NWSL history now. Um, And it it emulates the the train system near the CTA. It's called the L train for the Elevated. So we thought about it and, and props kudos to Anthony. He thought about it in a different light of being out there and kind of crazy. It's a cool Jersey. The players loved it. That always brings you some high hope, but I think from failures, you could see kind of how you like take a step back, see what you can do and and really go for it. I think we probably didn't have enough trust in what our creativity was at the time when we turned in the first one long, long run of it, like forever grateful Nike legal turned it down because we wouldn't have that, that kit today in the red stars, you know, kind of history, if you would. Two questions. One, when you say kit, tell everybody what you mean by that in case they're not familiar with it. Yeah. So it's, it's a jersey. So the, the jersey uh, in the in the soccer world is definitely called the kit. So you have different areas you can go with it. There's always a white kit, most likely, and, and a colored jersey. Um, and for the Red Stars, we really prided ourselves with the blue and, and what it looked like and, and everything like that. And with kits, jerseys, you just have so much freedom to kind of explore and, and get creative with it and really tie it to... Uh, what matters to the club and or the city. And I think it's something really exciting. And um, as I've joined the the marketing side here, it's something I've taken on. And unfortunately uh, with the Adidas timelines, it's it's for 2024. So I'm excited for Fire fans to see the 2024 jersey because it'll be the first one I've had kind of the open landscape, if you would, to, to design for the club. Okay. Thank you for that. And so second question, bouncing back yep. from that failure, right? And I'm sure yeah. you have this is going to sound weird. I'm sure you have failed again because we all do, right? It's inevitable. But whether it's that situation or another one, how do you, what's the mental game that you play with yourself? I, I probably doubted myself for the first 24 hours after getting that back and just kind of sitting down and, and taking it in. It's just, it's one of those things that I think you struggle with, right? Because when somebody or something or something happens and you fail, it's our natural reaction to be like, get down on ourselves, probably harder than anybody else can get down on you. And it's something I've definitely worked on since then. But for the first 24 hours, I actually put it to the side, sort of working on different stuff and just said, maybe we just have to go with one of our template items for, for, uh, I think it was the 2017 season. And so then Anthony and I just started chatting, thought about the Nigeria kit and what it might be, but still have failures today. Um, I, they're, they're probably a bit smaller than that and not as cool and and the outcome's not as good. Um, (laughs) I think, (laughs) I think it's one of those things that, um, you have to test and I'm, I, this might come off wrong, but uh, a lot of leagues just do the same stuff over and over again. And I, I get bored and it's, it's something new trends come along and new things come along. So I really, um, pride myself and I push, you know, the, the team here on content, creative marketing, paid social, like what, what's going to set us apart and what's going to be different. Um, because if we're trying to think about what Chicago is in this oversaturated market, it's going to be impossible to compete with, you know, the Cubs who have this long legacy or, you know, an NFL team with the bears. So how do we kind of think outside the box and, 
with that comes a lot of failure. And I think that um, helps you kind of grow and, and look outside the box and see that failed, but maybe there was a, a part of it, one tenth of it that that did succeed and, and how can we build off of that? And so I think knowing that everybody fails is, is a, uh, something that keeps me driving and moving because there's a team around you that will kind of lift you up and build you. And it's never something that's done alone. I think that's the biggest thing is, is your support system that's around you, whether it's Ishwara here at the, at the fire, that's our president or graphic design or soccer in the community. Like we're all here to have one common goal and that's to build this fire brand up as, as high as we possibly can. You said something interesting. Actually, everything you're saying is interesting, but one thing stood out to me, you get bored if you just do it the same way all the time. And to me, I, I hear that as you don't want to play it safe. So you don't fail because then you're not doing your job. You could do it, but that's not going to help you and your organization move the needle forward. Is that, is that fair to say? hundred percent. Yeah. I I hate the status quo. I hate uh, when you walk into a different sports organization, say, and everybody around that table is white men and they're all going to think exactly the same. I'm never not nervous when I go into those rooms, but I, I do everything I can to show that I'm not nervous and that I can handle this because it's just, it is, it's this, it's the status quo. And it's what we've seen now for, I don't know, as long as I've been in the industry and, you know, everybody, people are starting to to branch out a little bit. I think, Um, I think maybe TikTok helps out a little bit and and how people are thinking about it because it's those quick thing items. But if you look at schedule releases four to five years ago for every single team, they were all the same of like what they're thinking about. So um, I think we're seeing differences now in, in how people do it. But I think, how people think about merchandise, how people think about how they're marketing their players is, is all something that, that needs to change. And MLB is a perfect example. Everybody should know when walking on the street, if they were walking next to Mike Trout, but you might not know right now because it's just the marketing of, of who he is just isn't quite there yet. And I think there's, there's room to grow because if you can connect to a player on, and why you're connecting them, they might not love soccer, but if they could connect to our goalkeeper, Gaga Slonina, because he's from Addison, Illinois, and then you branch down to what else he might be interested off the field, they might be coming and buying a ticket or buying his jersey because they're interested in that player and not just the sports team. Yeah. Everything you just said made me want to go to a Fires game and a Red Stars yeah. game. Like, I'm like, wait, like, yes, like all this Let's makes go. sense. <laughs> yes, it all, it, it all makes sense. I love that. You have this, like you want, you're not going to play it safe. You get nervous. You are okay with failing because it means you guys are going to grow and it's going to help your organization. Failing is going to help the organization and help innovation. How do you lead a team and make sure they're okay with failing? I think that is a difficult thing for leaders to do. Yeah. And I think even if we were chat with Ashwar, who's our president and her background is insane, she would probably say she's still trying to figure that out because I think how you manage people, one person on my team can be very different than the other person on my team is, is such a key thing. We, we have a great team here and I think our entire front office is a, a great team and the culture we've built, I think, is, is a massive play in that, you know, sports is not a nine to five. So you need to find uh, the people that are, are ready to grind and ready to work on the weekends. And it's definitely not um, an easy job. And uh, there is the pride of working in sports. And I think people know that. But I think the thing that people don't realize is, it's not a nine to five. You never know what your weekends are going to look like. You never what, know what news might be dropping during midnight the, the, or a Friday fun, as I like to call them. You, you just never know. And so you're, you're on your toes. But I think that the team we have here and, you know, same when I was at the Red Stars, I, I told them, if, if you guys fail, um, it's probably, I love the idea. Let's run with it. I'll, I'll take, I'll take the backfall. And I think, you know, building them up and, and, letting them know they can fail is going to get more creative stuff out of it and more great content and more great marketing ideas. And there's, you know, some things we might have to pull back on or we can combo some ideas, but I think understanding that I will support them 100% and and be right there to say that, you know, I signed off on it. It was, I I loved the idea and and that's where things, you know, might not work out. We, We have season ticket deposits happening in you always see the same stuff of, you know, you the players secure your season tickets today. And we were just, you know, casually talking yesterday around 4 p.m. And Dibs is a here thing here in Chicago. Um, and it's, you know, once you shovel your your spot, you get to put something there. And it's called Dibs. It's a big thing in Chicago. Um, and we were like, why don't we put Dibs on a seat? And so to, to, tomorrow, tomorrow's Friday, our photographer, we have training at, at Soldier Field, is bringing a fake cash to put on a seat and we're just going to light dibs. And that's it. And keep it simple. And like, 
it, it definitely, I'll let you guys know, it, it has the potential to fail absolutely on the paid social side of it. Um, but what we're using it for, because I was like, maybe that's going to draw their attention quickly. And, and if it doesn't work, we brainstorm the idea together. We all love it. You got to test some stuff out. You never know what's going to work. So, um, you know, when it comes to the team, I, I really pride myself on being friends with everybody that's, that's on it. And whether that's somebody higher than me, whether that's um, the team that I'm working with day in and day out, you got to know them on a, on a personal level and know that you can connect with them and, and, and bring them and, and lift them up because uh, I'm definitely not in the position I am without the team that I've had since the beginning at the Red Star here at the fire. Some of the toughest conversations we have are the ones that we have with ourselves. We can convince ourselves to believe stories that we don't even know are true. What's crazy is we allow that story to take a toll on our confidence. Have you been there before? I know that I have. We get in our heads. We beat ourselves up. Here's some tough love. Nobody's got time for that. We are high achieving women who have big career goals. We don't have time to get in our own way. And I am here to support you with my new one-on-one coaching program, Step Into Your Power and Own Your Career. My clients have told me that when we work together, I've helped them get out of their own way, regain their confidence, learn how to manage their emotion and mindset. They've told me that they've been able to get their voice back and use it with confidence. The most important thing, they've told me that we've identified the obstacle that was getting in their way. If you want to learn more about this program, scroll down in the show notes, click on the link that says step into your power and own your career. You can set up time to chat with me and we can figure out if this is the right program for what you need. All right, let's get back to the episode. Some people don't understand what it means to connect with your team personally. Like they just are like, what? Like, I'm going to ask how your weekend is. We have five minutes to talk about it. And then like, that's it. Yeah, That's not connecting. Like on a Monday yeah. morning in your meeting, like, what'd you do this weekend? And then that's it. Like, no, 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 no. It's, it's yeah. much more than that. Like, how do you balance that? And you guys work hard. You already said you're working nights, weekends, whatever it takes. Yeah. How do you that find that time to balance getting to know your team. And also I'm asking you like five questions at once, but also drawing that line, right? Like of professional and personal as well. There's a definite line there. Um, and I think they all know that. I think it's one of those things that's kind of hard. I think it's probably one of the hardest things of the job is not thinking about these creative ideas, but it's uh, the management process of a team and in full transparency. I think my team right now, uh, Megan Cantwell, love her to death. She is my direct boss. She is vice president of marketing. She's out on maternity leave right now. So welcome to baby Olivia. She's adorable. Um, <laughs> but it's one of these things now where um, I've been tasked to kind of lead the entire department now. And it's one of, I, I messaged her and I was like, I just feel like a full-time admin right now. That's what it's kind of all right with. But it, it, it's a nice thing to know that my staff trust me enough to come to me with a good thing or a bad thing or what they, how they want to grow, where they want to grow. And I will be the first one to say like Kylie Sullivan, who um, does our paid social. So everything you can think of on the Facebook um, side, the digital side of everything. If she wanted to say, and she came to me and said, I kind of want to go back to organic social and what she did five years ago. I'd be the first one to be like, perfect. How can we get you to that spot? And I think that, that that's a big thing for me is how can I help you continue to grow? And I think people respect that. And I think also, you know, what we've already chatted about is um, I'm there to follow with you makes them want you more approachable. And I agree. I think I have one-on-ones with every single person on my team. And I think most of it is, you know, so they can ask me a few questions that might, I might've missed um, with everything going on. But most of it's like, you know, I'll ch- have a one-on-one with Emily who oversees our digital side. And they'll say like, how's Chris, her boyfriend, and uh, we'll go out to dinner with them and, and, and see it. And then, uh, but you know, there's, there's that line of not going to uh, 11 a.m. brunch with mimosas with you all, but you guys go have a great time. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> um, right. yeah. It just happened. And I love to see them go out on brunch and, and have a good time. But um, that's where the line caught. Can I go out to dinner with them? Of course. And, and have a good time and learn about them on a personal level. Am I going to um, an underground club with them afterwards? No. <laughs> it's good to know them on a personal level. And I think that's, that's the great thing about this office and the culture we build. It's, 
let's go have a marketing 4 p.m. happy hour and just get to know each other and let's close off and respect people's vacation days. And I think that's the biggest thing is just respecting people because we're all human and we all fail and we all have personal problems going outside of work. And Ishwara during everything, you know, the one thing she said since joining us is says like, if my daughter has a 3 p.m. volleyball game and I want to go see it, I might be on the sidelines answering emails there, but like, you can see me leave. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to my daughter's volleyball game more 10 years ago. She said, she would say like, have to run out family emergency or something like that. And you would kind of hide it. And I think um, if COVID brought anything out positively, it's something that, you know, we're, we're much more open and transparent here in the workplace. And I think should she's changed, it's been a cultural shift in that realm as well. And I think staff, you know, respond to that. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing is respecting one another, because if you don't have respect for somebody in, in um, I actually told this exactly to Ashwara, just be a good human. It's so easy to be a good human. So simple to be a good human. And people think it's so hard. And it's, if, if you can be a good human and, and show that people will just gravitate towards you and want to work with you. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it is that simple. Just be a good, <laughs> human. good human. Like, that's not that hard. No, it's really not. Go out and, and, and support your people. And um, whether that's, you know, where, how you want to, you know, we had a big thing with the, the Roe versus Wade thing. And I was, you know, one of the people like, how, how do we go about this from a, a branding perspective? But it's also affecting me personally. And how do I go about that? I was very happy that a couple of my employees, you know, rang me up immediately and was like, how can I help? What can we do to push this out? And and Tyler Emmerich, who unfortunately is now with San Diego Wave, leading, leading their marketing side and running that side, he was here at the time and he's a, a white straight male. And he goes... I can't help you with this. This should be yours. I'm here to draft anything you want up once you guys come up with it. But he's like, I can't help you come up with this statement. This is, this is you all. And so it's, it's surrounding yourself with those people that, that respect you in those boundaries and um, are there for you and it, it, the allies within, within all that. I love that. And it's interesting now, and I, I'm going to find the right way to say this. And here you talk about talking, you know, working with a male, a player, but still, a lot of times I'm hearing, I just had a call with someone the other day and she was like, you know, it's hard working in a male dominated industry and it's going to be really tough and it's gonna, I'm not going to get in. And I was like, tell me about your experience. And she's like, well, I haven't had any yet. Oh, well, well, you don't know yet. <laughs> you don't know yeah. what you don't know. You got to get in there first before you already feel defeated. Yeah. Right? So like your example just gives a good example of working with somebody in a male dominated industry. Like yeah. what is your, I just, I guess I'm curious more what's your, what's your experience been? What advice would you give women who are jumping on this narrative as and kind of carrying it as their own before experiencing it? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I think I can uh, generalize it more even just to like being a woman in sports, especially on the men's side. I can, I can even backtrack. I'm in a very, very fortunate situation that I have Ishwara as our team president. Um, she is one of three women in all MLS that, that has that title. So that definitely helps. When I first joined it, it was a, a man. Um, and it was a lot of, you know, it was pretty much all men on the executive team. And uh, what she's been able to switch and do in the last year and a half has been great and the right thing. And I think that's the biggest thing. And so ha- knowing I always have her support on stuff like that is, is definitely key. But um, working in men's sports is, or any sports to be fair, is there's going to be the man that always thinks they know more than you. It's just how our society has been aimed to yeah. think about, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, it's just what it is. Um, and I was on a call the other day and somebody said, just the, they, they mentioned a, a former NBA player who played for the Trailblazers. And I, they said, Justine, do you even know what we're chatting about? And I said, actually lived in Portland, big fan of the Portland Trailblazers, can talk to you all day about NBA or any sport, really. Like, pride myself on being a, a big sports nerd and maybe not so much the history of, of, of every sports league, but um, enjoy watching sports, women's sports, men's sports, doesn't make a difference. Been to every uh, playoff sky game so far and a few game regular season games, rooting for them to, you know, be recrowned here shortly. But, you know, you, you always deal with that. And um, I wish I could say I just, it just rolls off my shoulders, but it doesn't even, you know, 10 whatever many years I'm in in the industry, that one stuck with me a little bit. And, and there was uh, one of my colleagues was on the call who was a uh, who was also a female. And she was like, 
she messaged me and she's like, did they really just say that? And I was like, they did. And so I, I, I think men are at a point where they don't even realize what they're saying sometimes to women. Yes. Women in yeah. Court, yeah. That they think it's just so normalized and it's not. Um, and I think you never know until you try. Um, so like, for, for example, that person you were chatting with, like apply and, and I go uh, beyond that, um, reach out to, you know, if, if it was a position within, you know, marketing here at the Chicago fire, find my LinkedIn, reach out, shoot me a LinkedIn message. Like I have never turned anybody away because I wish I would have had some advice when I was kind of, and I was scared to reach out to people. And I think that's just part of being, you know, first of all, just a woman, not just a woman in sports, but you're scared of what you can can and cannot do. And then when you get into a sports world that is so male dominated, it gets even, I think, a little bit more um, scary and nervous. And and, um, I think having somebody in your corner that you could just say like, what's your advice here? And how can I help? Is, is so beneficial in so many ways. And don't be scared. You're, you're going to get turned down. Um, I've been turned down from jobs. It happens. But again, I think how we change that boardroom and that executive room also has a, has a play on the future of it shouldn't just be white men around the table. It should be people that show the diversity that's in the workplace. And I think that that's the biggest thing is, is switching the cultural mindset of sports and paying interns because a lot of people cannot take an unpaid internship. It's just not financially feasible for them. Paying interns is a big thing. Since the has come, we've done that. Switch the narrative there. Maternity, paternity leave, how we're thinking about that and working mothers and, and everything that kind of falls into this scope of how we think about things. We are the ones that have to change that narrative and keep fighting. And that's where I, I didn't mean for this to happen. Uh, myself and, and Megan Cantwell, but currently our entire marketing side um, so our paid social, the person who sees oversees our organic social, we're all women on that side. Our content and creative team is is not all women, but our marketing side right now is is completely made up of females. And I think that's so badass in the world we're in today to work for a mess yes. with an entire female marketing team. Yes, I love that. And I like what you said about just asking, get in, get the job. Don't carry around someone else's experiences as your own because you don't know what your experiences are going to be like. You might talk to the player who calls you and says, how can I help? I don't have the voice, but I will amplify yours, right? Like just get in first. And then when you get into a situation where you feel like, oh, I feel like they're trying to keep me under like their thumb or they're discrediting me, which happens in all industries, right? And when I say they, I mean men, that's when you can just ask for help. You don't have to go at it alone. Ask for some advice. Like, wait, this just happened and that didn't feel right. Talk to somebody and see if, you know, and then next time you're ready, if it happens again, or next time you're ready, if it's a new situation to kind of just say something and help make the change, right? Like start to, like you said, some people, men do not realize they're doing it. And so sometimes you have to just hello, <laughs> like, why, why would you say that to me and not, you know, Tim over here who's sitting over here, same right. level, and same I, age, same everything, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, that that's just changing how we think in, in our society today on, in every industry. I think that's, that's such a big thing of, I always see that women are less likely to apply to that job, but they're more qualified than the 10 men that, that have already applied for it. And it's just, it is, it's something I think that's just kind of in our back of our mind of, my resume is not good enough or this isn't good enough, but you don't know until you try and, and, and you might as well apply. And you can see on LinkedIn, you know, 150 people have applied for this job. I wouldn't take it personally. You never know who they're going to hire. I was up for a job uh, before I joined, joined the, the fire and they ended up hiring a, a white man who left six months in because he wasn't a right fit for the role. And they called me begging for me to come take the role. It was down to me and him. And I was like, sorry, I have a great job at the fire now. Like, I, when, as soon as I saw that happening, I, I figured that wasn't going to be the, you know, correct fit for y'all and, you know, put them in a bind. So I think, you know, between all that, and then also, you know, it goes back to just being a good person and that's on the men and the woman, however you identify is just, you know, be, be a good human. And I think there's that definitely the allies that will always have your back to, to support you. And I think that's the biggest thing. Somebody just that, you know, has your back and can lift you up is, is always key. Yeah, I totally agree. Someone will have your back. There's no need to carry around the weight of the world yes. on your shoulders if you haven't had experience. It's good to be in like informed and in know what's going on, but it's yeah. also good to just 
get in there and do you and put your own mark on this and like to see how it goes before you make up this opinion of how you think it might go. 100%. Yes. Trust yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Are you ready for rapid fire questions? Let's go. (laughs) All right. 12 questions. First thing that comes to mind. What is your favorite sports moment? Ooh, uh, NCAA uh, first round hosting when I played at Oregon State. Oh, yes. Well, now you got to tell us like what happened. (laughs) <laughs> it was a, a personally good game for me, but it was the first time Oregon State women's soccer had ever hosted as well. Sadly, we lost in like the eighth or ninth PK. Uh, we had, we've made it to the Sweet wow. Sixteen. We played Notre Dame uh, the year before, hosted that year against University of Portland, obviously a storied program on the women's soccer side. Scored my first collegiate goal that game and then uh, hit, hit a PK. My family was there, obviously from California. They would come as much as they could. Um, so having them there and it's just, you know, one of those moments, I think just winning it, not winning with your best friends up by your side and kind of uh, not going out how you want it, but playing together and, and just living in that moment, I think is probably my, my highest career moment in sports. Can you talk about this PK for a second? <laughs> it is what I still remember as a former soccer player, still remember the ones that I've missed oh, yeah. and they didn't even matter like a camp or something. And we were in PK or whatever. How do you mentally prepare for those? And how has that like transferred over to your everyday like career? Yeah. Now? I mean, we're all stressed, right? That, that, that is probably a very stressful moment. Yes. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I, I enjoy taking that fifth PK for those that don't know, like that, that could be the, the make or break it. And I remember um, him handing me the ball. We were, we were the second kickers and saying, if you, the, the rest of this, he said, if you, uh, just so you know, it's four, three or whatever. And both our first kisser, kickers missed or something like that. If you miss this, you lose. And I, I, I thrive on that. I, I love having that kind of pressure. I, I really enjoy it. And so, you know, slotted it into the back of the net, called it a day. Um, unfortunately, you know, once we got towards the end, it didn't go that way. It was an unfortunate bounce once we got to the eighth or ninth kicker, but you know, there's always pressure and there's pressure in any industry. And I think that that translates so well, um, especially I might be biased here, but I think athletes, you know, we're, we're so used to having a timeline of this is how things are done, working your hardest because you want to be on that field and that competitive advantage. And I think that has just translated very, very much so into to my professional life where I am today of thriving under pressure and letting it kind of build me up, if you would. Yes. All right. Sorry. I'm not following my own rules. Okay. That was good. Thank you for sharing. All right. What is something people always get wrong about you? Ooh, I think people think I'll just fold. I like to think I'm a good human. Um, and I think, you know, the white stuff I've gone through has, has got me to there. Um, so, you know, when I sit at the table, I might act nice, but if you're, if you're coming at me with a, a contract or something like that, you know, for the other side, I've been told if, if you're in contract negotiations and the person across from you likes you, you're probably doing it wrong. And so I'll act nice in the beginning, kind of throw through it all, but I'm definitely not going to be pushed over in, in any sense. And I think people think uh, I might be pushed over a little bit. <laughs> I like that one. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> what is one food you wouldn't want to give up? Ice cream. Are you a morning or a night person? Morning. Favorite holiday? Christmas. Are you a dog or a cat person? Dog, not even close. (laughs) Did you say dog? Yeah, dog, not even close. (laughs) What products would you seriously stockpile if you found out they weren't going to sell it anymore? I just want to go with my my immediate thought was just like Nike shoes. I'm a big shoe person. Okay. Are you like a sneakerhead or? I am a sneakerhead. (laughs) It's not a good quality. (laughs) Well, what's your favorite app? Ooh, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to push our own Chicago fire FC app. Oh, well, well, well done. <laughs> Clearly she's in marketing Twitter, TikTok, or Instagram. Professionally Twitter, my own time, TikTok. All right. Should I download TikTok? I'm afraid. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't recommend it because the time I waste in bed when I could just be sleeping is, is hours. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Then I won't do it. All right. Who is your biggest inspiration in life? Uh, probably my grandma. Oh, as a child, what did you want to become when you grew up? Pro surfer. 
Mm. Yep. All right. Last one. Finish the sentence. The future of women working in sports is? Is infinite. Yes. Love it. This yeah. has been awesome, Justine. If someone wanted to get in touch with you, how can they go about doing it? As I mentioned, reach out on LinkedIn. Um, all, all my personal information is, is out on the web and in some realm, rather because I'm PR, so my cell's on there. Email, however you guys find a way to get a hold of me. I mentioned Twitter. Um, I, I really use Twitter from a professional sense. I think um, I urge our players to do the same just because I think you can connect with fans on a different level on Twitter than any other app. So yeah, however you all can find a way to get in touch with me, feel free to do so. I'm always happy to you know chat or, or help the next generation. Fantastic. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you. I, I had a great time. I, I really enjoyed this and uh, excited to have you in uh, my back pocket as a connection. <laughs> yes, likewise. Hey, Game of Thrones listeners. Don't you just love Justine? I hope you enjoyed listening to Justine's journey in sports. One of my biggest takeaways how can we all move forward and make sure fear doesn't cause us to play it safe? Honestly, no one's got time to play it safe. So as you show up for work, I want you to ask yourself, will you feel the fear and do it anyways? I hope, I hope, I hope the answer is yes, because really we need you and I know you can do it. I believe in you. Until next week, my friends, let's stay connected. Join me on Instagram. You can find me at Jahan Blake and make sure to say hello. I love connecting and getting to know the Game of Her Own community. Talk soon.